So today I want to answer some of the questions you guys have about our EV street charger. And in particular, I'm referring to questions that came up on this video. It's been super hard for me to get back to all of your comments and all of the emails that I've been sent. So I wanna make this video just to fill you in on things that we haven't touched on yet. So let's start with the big question. And this really revolves around sharing the charger because this is the key thing that we see for our charger that really en will enable widespread deployment and use. The ability to have a charger that is privately owned, put into a public setting, and then able to meter power to other users. We think that's a key factor in getting these things deployed and in really changing the charging landscape. So to do that, you're essentially metering power out of the chargers using a simple uh, coil in there to monitor power that's going out to the vehicle. And this allows the charger to link that power usage with a user account on the person who is taking the electricity. And it racks up how much energy has been deployed to the car through that period of time. It bumps it to our network. Same thing on the user front. That user is tied to that session. And then we line everything up we say this is what that charger owner is charging for electricity during that session. We will take that money from the person who's charging. We will supply that back to the person whose charger it is. Now there's different ways of doing that. It could happen at every session you do a transaction. It could also do an aggregated thing on a monthly basis. We could have a preloaded account. Some of those details have yet to be determined and honestly we're looking for you guys to kind of provide feedback on what will work the best. Now, related to that is authentication. And authentication is super important because you don't just want any random person rolling up to your charger, plugging in and stealing your power. They have to be linked to a user account. And so we will do that. We'll link them to a user account. They will roll up to the charger. And for the time being, we will use a QR code on the charger. The person will scan it with their app that will link them to that charger for that session. And then the charger will unlock and provide power to them. In the future though, we hope to integrate some other things like RFID that could be more passive and you would actually plug in and it would kind of authenticate automatically. You can also use some of the upcoming plug and charge protocols to do a similar thing. But for the time being, to eliminate some of the costs of that extra equipment and some of the complexities there, we want to stick with something a little simpler. We'll just run it through the network on a, a QR code. Now, interestingly, there is passive authentication today and this is really due to the fact that it's a detachable cord charger and there really isn't detachable cords out there so if you get this charger and you install it and you have the detachable cable you're going to be probably the only person around for a couple years that has that cable now is that perfect no but it's pretty good for a little while in fact we think that the passive uh, barrier of having to plug in a cable to a charger at least for a little while will be attractive for places like hotels um, where they may want to just hand out cables to their customers and let them use it. Now, eventually this will change when everybody has cables, but for the time being, that makes a lot of sense to do that. So speaking of hotels, let's talk about some other contexts. How does this apply in apartment buildings or multifamily dwellings or parking garages? Uh, we think it really applies, and some of that has to do with some of the uh, design changes on the technical front that we've made, and I'll, I'll touch on that later in the video. But the, what we're looking at is rolling out a solution that homeowners can deploy and really you know, put on our network. They can build people for power that is being used, but it also goes and fits right into a, a business context or an apartment building. So that apartment building owner can deploy say 10 chargers. They can manage all of them and distribute power to each user in the same way that you would as an individual. And so we think this fits really well into these broader contexts where you have multiple chargers run by a single provider of electricity, which would be, you know, say your landlord. So how legal is this? And what are the regulations about putting a charger out on the street? In the cities I've talked to near where I live, they all have slightly different rules. This section here between the sidewalk and the street is what's considered kind of the right of way. And that means you need special easement permits to go into this area with a charger. Now, is that impossible? No, 
It's just that the cities may have not come up with the methods of doing that yet. And the cities I've talked to have been very open to exploring that. It might involve some extra considerations with your neighbors, getting some feedback from them, taking that to the city council, but it is possible to get an install like this permitted. And we're very optimistic that this will happen all over the US. We also got a few questions on parking and how that would work. And that's a little bit more difficult. So some cities might be willing to reserve a spot for you right by your charger, but others may not. And this is what we're trying to solve in the long term, because if you had a whole bunch of these in one neighborhood and you're able to share back and forth with your neighbors, you should be able to find a spot somewhere else relatively nearby that you can get power from. Now, is that entirely ideal? Is that what you want to be doing? No, you would rather be at your own. Uh, but each city, once again, is going to approach this differently. The cities I've talked to personally about this, they said they didn't want to reserve charging, but I have seen cities in the past do that. So I think there will be a variety of things that, that come about on the parking front. But the biggest solution is really to just get more out there. Some people commented about running cords across the sidewalk and that's the whole point of having this thing is so you don't have to do that. You get it on the, the curb side of the sidewalk and then you get your cord running to your vehicle. So you're solving all those trip hazards and things like that. And that really solves a lot of the problems with people running extension cords, which is kind of the, the state of the art solution today. So how do you install this thing here on the far side of the sidewalk? Well, there's a couple interesting ways to do this. One is called hydro excavation. You basically take a piece of conduit, put a garden hose on the end and you can pressurize, wash your way under the sidewalk. That's actually what I did here to get over to, to this point. Uh, worked really well, I went under in a few minutes. Other installs that I've worked on, we've had to actually dig under the sidewalk kind of manually. In some cases, like one I looked at the other day, we're going to have to cut the sidewalk. It's too wide and then the actual post actually will mount onto the sidewalk. So there's a lot of different options depending on the situation. But in a lot of cases, going under sidewalks, things like that aren't as difficult as you would think. And that's a big plus because this is not easy to install. You are gonna have to run lines out. You're gonna have to do some trenching, things like that. So it will increase the cost slightly, but not unlike if you're running a new power line out to a garage. And the real beauty of this system is it's on your home's power supply. You're not running off of a main power supply. So the city or the utility is not out here trenching and putting in new meters, new poles, new lines up and down the street. And that really simplifies things relative to that case. There was a question on the charger electronics and where they're located and if they could be located inside the house. And whoever wrote that question, they're correct. The charger electronics were originally in the post for a long period of time. And I resisted moving them out of that because the electrician could just run a line out to the post. It was a very clean install. However, all of the charger electronics are now in a box, which will go in the house. And then that is distributed out to the socket which is in the post or in another electric box somewhere. And we really like this distributed system for a couple of reasons. For one, it is safer. When we talked to the cities, they were concerned about vehicles hitting the posts and having live wires out there. And if you have the electronics in the house, if the post gets hit and damaged, the live wires just aren't live because they're relayed in this guy back in the house and power is only released when a vehicle is successfully connected to the charger. So if, even if it's plugged in and it gets hit and the wire gets knocked between the vehicle and the charger, it's going to kill the, the charger relay here and not distribute power. So that was the one major reason that we moved it inside. A second reason that is really important is you have better Wi-Fi connectivity in a building. And if we would deploy in the post, we'd really have to look at going with an LTE style system where we are actually pulling in cellular data to that post. And that increases expense, it increases complexity, um, and just not something we wanna do if we don't have to. The third reason is it's keeping it a little bit more out of the elements and in particular heat. So that post is pretty space constrained. And when you put a lot of high power electrical equipment into a small space, heat becomes a concern. And that was something we hadn't necessarily had issues with, but 
our temperatures were pretty high and we were happy to be able to take things out of the heat, so to speak, especially if you're gonna put this somewhere like Arizona, you might have to paint that post white or a light color just so it doesn't get baked so much from the sun. Now, there's other side benefits of doing this that we realized after the fact. And one of those is in the application I discussed previously with Modi Family or large deploys where you could have a single head unit or you have a bunch of these chargers in one location talking to each other doing power sharing and then you have distributed sockets elsewhere and what this allows you to do is really have all your big stuff in one location in a location where it can be hidden away and then just deploy these really tiny discrete outlets wherever you need to plug in your cords and that's a really cool solution and we think that's really a huge game changer when it comes to charging even beyond the street so how compatible is this charger with different vehicles? And I can honestly say it's pretty much the most compatible charger out there because we have a common cord socket on the charger. And then on the vehicle side, you can have the other end of the cord be whatever your car is, J1772. So like this guy, you could have it be Nax, like this guy and whatever else there is out there that you want to put on that end to connect to your vehicle. So what are we doing on the socket side? And we've looked at J1772, we've looked at NAX, and we also have looked at type two Menikes, which is what this guy is. It seems that the industry, and many of you have pointed this out, is going with the type two, even in the United States. Is that ideal? Not necessarily, because this has extra pins that you don't really need for three-phase power, and I, I really don't think those will really get used much on BYOC situations. But it is what the industry is standardizing on with the J3400 standard, and so we have decided to go with that standard, and we're working on an implementation of that socket. We want our cables to be compatible with what some other folks are doing, like It's Electric or some other people who have or are beginning to roll out some BYOC chargers in the United States. That way you can use the same cable no matter where you go. And that's really going to be the beauty of BYOC is we'll have a standard plug. And then, like I said, you can go from type two to J1772 or type two over to NAX. And that will really allow all the cars to be compatible with all of the detachable cable chargers. One final bit with the cable, and that is, does it lock to the charger? And yes, the Menikes Type 2 connector locks to the charger. There's a little pin that goes in a little hole here, and that keeps it from being removed while it's charging. Now, we're working on ways to do this in a really compact way, and I'm excited to share that with you when it's ready. We're also looking for ways to do this in a way that's really hassle-free and is also super reliable. The reliability is the one thing that actually turned me off to automatic locking connectors several years ago. I was actually looking at forums in Europe where people would take their type two cords and cut the top of the connector so that it didn't lock on the post. And this was because they would have issues with them locking to the post and not being able to remove it. And you can imagine your frustration when your cord that you bought is stuck to a post. So we really wanted to avoid that. And my initial way of doing that was to take locks off and try to work some other more passive ways of locking for those who need it. But ultimately with going to the type two connector, we need to have the lock on there. So these will lock to the post. Now we know there's plenty more questions than what I've addressed today. Hopefully this can help to alleviate some of the questions and maybe it's raised new questions. So keep feeling free to comment questions in the comments. Uh, you can also continue to directly email me. I'll drop my email down here again. And then we also do have a website. It's coolstreet.com. And on there, we do have a wait list. And over 400 of you guys, 450 of you guys have actually signed up on there and we're looking for more. This wait list really helps to inform what the interest in our product is. And it's really helpful for us to see what people are looking for and also kind of tailor our solution to fit that. So jump on there if you feel like it, I'll fill out that wait list, that would be great. And I will see you guys in the next video.